Yeah? Okay. Thank you back there. Welcome, everybody. We're so thrilled that so many of you showed up and want to learn more about water. I think there's probably a range in the audience. Uh, I'm Kate Fitzpatrick. I'm the executive director of the Deschutes River Conservancy. I'm going to take a very quick poll. How many people here have heard of the DRC before this series? Oh, wow. How many people, um, is the DRC new to you? Very cool, yeah. And then how many people um, moved here within the last year? Nice. Thanks for coming in and wanting to learn about water right away. How many people have been here for 10 or more years? All right. Steve, you don't count. You left and came back. But if you added it up, maybe it was 10. <laughs> okay, great. Well, we're so excited to have you here. Um, just a couple words about the Deschutes River Conservancy. I felt a couple of raindrops coming in, and now I'm smelling smoke, so I don't think it knows what it's doing out there. We've been really lucky. I was excited about the rain, but we'll see. Okay, should I proceed? Okay, great. So the Deschutes River Conservancy was formed in 1996 by the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs, which includes the Wasco, Paiute, and Warm Springs tribes and um, along with irrigation and environmental interests, with a mission to restore stream flow and water quality to the whole Deschutes Basin using collaborative tools and consensus. So working together on win-win solutions to stay away from fighting about water. So we've been implementing projects and programs for 26 years that have had uh, significant success doing this while taking care of our community. I think we have restored more stream flow than any basin in the West. So we're very proud of that, but more importantly, we know that we can do this together as a community. We have the tools, we just have to work together. <clears throat> and as you'll hear tonight, we have a lot of work to do, which is why it's so important that everyone in the public understands water and is able to engage in the solutions and advocating for the solutions and, and really taking care of our watershed. So thank you for coming. The reason we started the seminar series is because <clears throat> it's so cliche, but water is complex. It's like you can go into rabbit holes, water rights, water law. You're going to have these lovely people try to keep it... Um, try to keep it pretty simple for you tonight because it should be understandable. But we recognize that it's hard for the public to engage in water. So we launched a 12-month seminar series where we're diving in deep once a month on a certain topic so you can really you know, dig in and ask the questions and get the understanding that's so important. Tonight is our second series um, of the year. And before I launch into that, um, oh, we do want feedback. This is kind of a a cool conversational format that we're going to use tonight. It's also hybrid. We're live streaming it, and you can watch it whenever you want in the comfort of your own home. It's video recorded. Um, so I want to thank the sponsors of the seminar series. We had the City of Bend just come on. We have Hand in Hand Productions that's helping with this um, live video streaming media situation. Uh, Open Space Event Studio, which is this beautiful space that you're in tonight. Patagonia, Central Oregon Intergovernmental Council, Mount Bachelor Rotary Club of Bend, Wanderlust Tours, um, and we're still looking for sponsors if anyone knows of businesses or are interested because we feel pretty strongly about keeping this free to the public so anybody can come. Um, so tonight we're talking water rights, um, who owns, you know, who has the water rights, and I just wanted to frame that with a couple overarching thoughts that you're going to hear a lot about who has the right to use water, but it's really important to know that under Oregon water law, water belongs to the public. The public owns the water. The other thing that's important is that that statement in and itself could use some thought because before the Oregon public existed and before we owned the water, there were indigenous people here living on the land and using the water already. So just a couple things to frame the talk tonight. Um, and in that, in that note, I want to do a quick land acknowledgement. Uh, we honor the Native people who have called this region home for thousands of years. We join them in stewardship of our rivers for the next seven generations. Now I'm going to introduce your esteemed panelists tonight. Um, Lisa Seals is going to um, moderate uh, or encourage a conversation with Kyle Gorman. Lisa is our program manager at the DRC. She has a PhD in collaborative water management, which focused in part on the Deschutes Basin. She has worked in the basin for 12 years. She has background teaching natural resources classes at OSU Cascades and a, a passion for education and making things understandable. Kyle Gorman is the South Central Region Manager for the Oregon Water Resources Department. 
He is one of five region managers in the state. The Oregon Water Resources Department is responsible for managing and regulating water. Um, he has worked in Bend for the department for 32 years. Um, he's also a member of the DRC board. And if you were to tap into his brain, you would see come spilling out an inordinate amount of water rights and hydrologic information about the Deschutes. So we're really lucky to have him here tonight. And I want to add that we just learned, well, that he has a twin brother, which I haven't known in 18 years of knowing him, but also that his birthday is tomorrow. So I don't know if we need to fully sing, but maybe um, wish Kyle happy birthday when you see him afterwards. And, uh, <laughs> Um, and with that, I will hand it over to Lisa. I, I think I might. I think I think, if it works correctly. So, yeah, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. It's fantastic to see so many of you here. I know in Bend in the summer, there's a lot of competition for things to do in the evening. So we're really grateful that you chose to spend the evening with us, even those of you online or those of you that will watch this later. Um, yeah, so as Kate mentioned, this is the second of our series, so I just wanted to point out that we're really trying, we're kind of trying to hit the, the sweet spot of making it interactive and, and entertaining and fun for those of you in the audience, but also being really conscious of the people that are streaming at home. Um, so last time we really, really encouraged questions sort of immediately, um, and this time instead of you know, asking you guys to interrupt us and ask all the questions, we're going we're gonna to still ask you to interrupt us and ask questions if it's a clarifying question about something that we said that is not understandable. Because the, 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 long, the long and the short of it is that Kyle and I could talk about this stuff for like six years and we could go into you know wonky water talk and all of a sudden nobody, you guys are just blankly staring at me and I have no idea what's going on. So I'm gonna wanna kinda treat you like a classroom where you are, you're telling me if I'm not hitting the mark and we're, we're using acronyms all of a sudden or terms that don't make sense. So, Please stop us for clarifying questions. But when it comes to deeper issues that we're maybe not touching on during the presentation or that we want you want to hear more about, if you could keep a note of that question, maybe you could even use the back of your comment cards, um, and then we'll have a Q&A time at the end of the presentation to kind of dive a little bit deeper. So um, hoping you all can follow, follow that. And then, yeah, we're looking for feedback. And basically, we're trying to respond to the feedback last time that we received, which was maybe hold most of the questions to the end. So this is the trying to strike the balance of, of making it interactive, but also holding questions to the end. So um, yeah, thank you so much, everybody, for being here. And we're just going to launch on in and uh, show you a beautiful picture of a place that we call home. This should be familiar to to all of you. Um, most people know where this is. Even if you landed in Bend yesterday, you might know where this is. This is a photo of the river taken um, up, uh, taken obviously by drone by air near the old mill um, and the Whitewater Park. And so we're showing you this picture because this is what most people think of when they think of the Deschutes River. And from this picture, it doesn't really look like there are any issues or problems, right? It looks beautiful and picturesque. And this is why people visit Bend and move to Bend for this beautiful, beautiful river. But um, as many of you may know, but we're going to talk a lot more about tonight, there are issues um, with the river that are, are all not entirely apparent to folks in the city. So this picture is a picture taken in October, I believe by Kyle Gorman here. He took this picture in October from Lapine State Park. Um, so this is after irrigation diversion season stops. And this is what the upper river then um, has looked like uh, throughout the last 60 plus years. So, um, and then we have another photo of uh, Wychus Creek, which runs through the city of Sisters. For those of you that are familiar, it's that beautiful little creek running through the city of Sisters. And this is before any of the DRC's work um, was done, or any of the partners worked together to do what we're going to talk about tonight, which is restoring flows. Um, and the water actually that's in this picture uh, is interesting to note. This actually got diverted downstream from this photo. So essentially, that stream got completely diverted and ran dry like two out of three um, years, even more, Kyle says. A lot of, I mean, it pretty much ran dry in the city of Sisters most of the time before the work um, that we have, that the DRC does before that began. So that is essentially the backdrop um, of why we're, why we're talking about this stuff. So we can explain how this all happened and what we're doing to kind of try to fix these issues. Um, and so yeah, our presentation tonight is going to really dive into the history of water rights and water law and, um, 
and explain kind of how we got to where we are today and what are the tools that we're using to help restore flows in the basin. So that's, that's our goal tonight. Um, and I am super thrilled, like Kate said, to have Kyle here because I can't think of anyone who's more knowledgeable and has more experience working in the basin than this man. Um, and there's no better person to tell the story of the history. So I, I really appreciate, appreciate that. I also want to make a note, too, that um, there aren't any villains in this story. Um, basically, what we have today is the result of history. And I like there's a history, there's a history st statement in the audience on a t-shirt that says, don't make me repeat myself, history. <laughs> and history is responsible for what we where we are today. So I just want to point that out, you know, and the solutions require all of us working together collaboratively. So just want to make that point. Okay, so um, Kyle, thanks for being here with me. And um, let's start at the beginning, right? Uh, all um, right. Well, well, sort of the beginning. Yeah, thanks for the introduction and thank you for the <laughs> birthday wishes. I appreciate that. <laughs> We're very happy that you're willing to spend the evening with yeah, us. Yeah, so I, I've worked my entire career in Bend. Uh, originally started out as a water master in the basin. So I started out as a water master, graduated to region manager, and took on a little bit more territory to, to manage and work in. And it gave me great perspective on the Deschutes Basin. I um, also want to acknowledge that uh, I worked for a gentleman by the name of Bob Main, who was my predecessor, and he was on the DRC board, and I learned a tremendous amount from him because he actually, when he first started with the department, he worked with the water master who worked in the basin from the 1930s until the 60s, and he would have coffee with that guy, and he would have those conversations, and he passed that information on to me, so I have to recognize that a lot of the things I learned was from Bob and then from a, a previous water master named Aubrey Perry. But uh, like any other uh, Western state, uh, let's roll the clock back to the 1800s, 1850s. Uh, the West, the federal government wanted the West to be settled. One of the ways to get people out here was to uh, develop irrigation on property. And there was this act called the Carry Act, where if a person put water to beneficial use on a piece of property, they, be they could become owner of that property. And so a lot of the Central Oregon lands were developed under the Carry Act. But the first settlers that came to the basin, they're in their wagons. There was no electricity, no motels, no anything here. And it was open and it was a, an area where, hey, we, if we can use water, we can live here. And that was the mindset of folks settling in the area. They would find a piece of property next to a stream, so right adjacent to a stream. and in the 1800s, they would say, well, the first thing we got to do, build a house and divert the water from the stream. And what does divert water from the stream mean? They literally, uh, the family would go out and dig a ditch from the stream to their farmland and spread that water out onto their fields to grow hay for their cattle. And then they probably, most of them had vegetable gardens to grow the food that they could stockpile in the winter. And, and a lot of uh, Central Oregon, as well as all Western states where individual uh, farmers, families would develop these irrigation rights. And prior, uh, the first mechanism to uh, attain a water right would be to stake a claim. And so just like mining, uh, the water rights of the West are started out that way that uh, the first person to stake a claim to water, they would say, okay, I'm gonna use this much water on this stream and in this location. And uh, that claim uh, established what's called the priority date. And the, the claim would go to a local jurisdiction. So any one of the court, county courthouses around Oregon, uh, people would submit their claim to the county courthouse. And on paper, there were no computers back then, and, and all those records start accumulating in all the individual courthouses around the state. Um, and then you can imagine that you know, the fire suppression systems in courthouses in the 1800s weren't up to today's standards, so a courthouse might burn down. Where did all the records go? They're all made out of paper. All the records for whose water right was where are now gone. And so the state recognized that this is too much chaos, uh, <laughs> even in 1900. Because this was happening from like the mid 1800s all the way through the you know turn of the century into the early 1900s. Just everyone staking claims, right and left, diverting water with ditches, 
um, yeah, just that, and that, it's, it's the Wild right. West. <laughs> yeah, and, and if there was a so. dispute that arose, it was handled by the sheriff. Do we have a clarifying question? Sorry. Yeah. Yep, thank you. Now I forgot. Um, so they're staking a claim. Is there actually a, um, a race to go upstream? Do people recognize the value of being upstream in those water rights? Or that's, is that a, that's a really good question, and we're going to talk about that. And actually, where you are on the stream doesn't, doesn't really, it was all about who came first. So it doesn't matter where you are, in the, but that's an excellent question. Um, yeah, so. <laughs> so along those lines, so you stake the claim, you had your, you established your priority date. Uh, the records in the state were all over the place. It was, it was, it was a mess. And so uh, just after the turn of the century, uh, you know, economic development settlement was still the mindset of the folks in the state. I don't know what the population was, but it wasn't nearly as much as it is now. And they realized we've got to have some kind of order to systems. We've got to have a, a centralized uh, uh, system to allocate water, to uh, determine how much is available, uh, to derive economic development in the state of Oregon. Yeah. And so the uh, state of Oregon adopted the water code in 1909. And so prior to 1909, a water right is considered an adjudicated water right. And so an adjudicated water right means that it goes through the court system. So if you have, a, if anybody's a water right holder out here and the priority date of that water right is uh, before 1909, you will have what's called an adjudicated water right. And that water right was determined by a judge. So in 1909, when the state adopted the water code, February 24th, 1909, uh, the, a person that wanted to use water now had to go to Salem and say, I would like to use water at this location for this amount, uh, and here's my application. And the application for that water right established the priority date. And the state engineer at the time, which is a former entity for the Water Resources Department, looked at the basin, looked at the stream, and said, yep, I think there's water available. And back in 1909, it was pretty much a guarantee, walk in in the morning, get your water <laughs> right in the afternoon. All it's right. not like that anymore. No, not like that anymore. So I just want to take a quick pause and make sure that we fill in a few a few potential gaps. So um, <laughs> this whole idea of diverting water, right? I mean, people are out there, they're digging canals from the stream in, in basalt, right? Volcanic basalt to be able to put that water on the landscape and spread it across the landscape using flood irrigation. Because again, no pumps, no sprinklers. I mean, that's, that's what was going on. And they were building these diversion dams, basically, and using... And this is, this is one that was probably built, um, Kyle says, in the 40s. But you know, they were using rocks. They were using whatever they can find, earth, to try to stop up the stream and get it to flow into these, these diversions. Um, yeah, so the, it was really just everybody out there getting, getting the water that they, that they needed from streams that they were being able to live somewhat close to, right? Um, and the priority dates were established by when they got that right, that right whether it was in the local court or whether after 1909 it was in um, Salem. And this is, speaks to your question in the audience about the upstream downstream thing. So in the East Coast, um, it does have everything to do with upstream and downstream, but in the West Coast, it has everything to do with the date that your right was handed to you. So the people who came first, they got all the water. Um, and, that, and the people who came next might not get any water, like unless all the water was actually Able, there was enough water there for that for the person who had that older right. So does that does that make sense to folks? Okay. Um, so this is the this is the the wonky word of prior appropriation, which you'll hear a lot. That is literally the law that governs all water rights across the entire Western United States. So not just Oregon. Um, yeah. And then Kyle was starting to get into like what are the other sort of elements of a water right? Um, and I will also let you guys know we'll make all these slides available to folks after afterwards, just so they so that you all know. Um, and there's cheat sheets, actually, that you have in your seats from what we talked about last time, just in case you, just out of curiosity, how many people were here last time? OK, oh, great. I got some repeat offenders. That means we probably didn't scare you off. <laughs> That's good. Um, OK, so Kyle, let's talk about what, um, so in 1909, the state set up the system. People are going to Salem, and they're getting water rights. Um, let's talk about what is on an actual water right. Like, what does it include if you go and get a water right? Okay. I want to mention, though, first talking about yep. how, so go back to that slide. Oh. 
So you have these ditches. You see that diversion structure. It's fairly crude. It's a way to control water. Um, and then you have, you inevitably have fights. <laughs> who gets the water? How is it settled? And who, who does that? So in the, the state, uh, probably just after 1909, established two divisions. Division one was west of the Cascades. Division two was east of the Cascades. So there was a, a state engineer that oversaw uh, the, the east side of the Cascades. And then there were water masters that were paid by the counties. So they weren't state employees, which uh, water masters are now, but they were paid by the counties. And each county had a water master or multiple counties. And it was the water master's job to go out and look at the ditches, look at the water right and say, okay, this senior user, 1910 water right, doesn't matter what it was. I, when I say what it was, what the use was, it didn't matter. It was what is the priority date? And there was a junior user upstream that was diverting water, depriving that, that senior water right of their water. The water master would shut that ditch off completely until the senior water right got every drop they're entitled to. And so it didn't, there was no fairness to it whatsoever. It was whatever your priority date is, and if you're the most senior, you get the, time, the water in times of shortages. Yeah. End of story. And that system is still in place today. today. Like, we are still living that way. Um, Well, yeah, let's, yeah. So okay, the question so let's go from, to the next one. Yeah, the question from the audience was about what is every drop that they were entitled to and what is that number? And so now we're going to talk about what's on a specific water right, and that answers your question. The amount was actually part of what's included in these priority dates, which was the priority date was on the water right. Tell us more about what else is included in a water right, Kyle. Okay, <laughs> so the first on the list, and it's the most important, is the priority date. But the priority date is relative to the other priority dates on the stream. Right. So for instance, a 1900 water right on Wychus Creek gets water a, a maybe a month, a year. A 1900 priority date on the Deschutes River gets water all season long in abundance. And so it's the relative priority date. How you stack up against other water rights on the stream, that your water right lies. Right, so is that, again, has everything to do with who got there, literally, who, who got, got there, there first, first, who state, you know, staked their claims, and then those claims were, you know, eventually, uh, there was the, um, sorry, not, what's the other, adjudicated. They were adjudicated, adjudicated. As, when they were in local courts, um, and so it was all about who came first. So first thing, priority right, priority date. Yes, and then water rights are not unlimited. Uh, there is a rate associated with it. So a person might irrigate 20 acres, so they would have, uh, 200 gallons per minute. That's their rate at which they can divert water from the stream. Uh, and so far we've been always talking about diversions, uh, gravity feed and ditches. Um, I don't know if we'll get into later on in greater technology, but anyway, uh, you can, that one picture we had showed a weir and a weir is a common uh, device to measure water flow. Back to that. That's this guy right here. And so if that you hear the term weir, yeah is actually what they're using. This is the technology that they use to measure how much water, to the rate, to your point, of how much water. And this technology also is still in place today. Like yes. you can go, I don't know, people might own land and have a weir on their property. It is very much what we're still using. Um, so yeah. So the water master would go out and look at the weir and say, this person's entitled to 200 gallons a minute. And if they were taking 220, he'd say, oh, well, you shouldn't have called me. Because uh, I'm going to cut your rate back to 20 gallons a minute down to 200, what you're limited to, and then that extra water goes down to the next user. Right. Uh, place of use. That's another important p aspect of a water right is that you, you're, the water right, and if it's an irrigation right, it's restricted to a certain area. There's a fancy term called a pertinency, and that means the water right's attached to the land. Right. And it can only be moved if you file a transfer through the water resources department's administrative process. Right. So a water right is fixed to the land in a certain area and a certain amount of acres. And that's a very important point because again, this is all still in play today. So the water rights are tied to specific parcels of land with specific rates um, and specific dates. Like it's all, yeah, that's the system. <laughs> so. And beneficial use uh, is a is a term that's somewhat hard to define. Typically, you know it when you see it, so it's beneficial use. But uh, a definition of beneficial use 
a very simplistic form of beneficial use is if you have an irrigation water right, your water right says for irrigation, you have to use it for irrigation. You can't use it for something else. Right. If you want to put a power plant in or you want to do some kind of manufacturing, you can't do that. You, the water right use is specific on the water right. right. And to change it, you have to go through the transfer. Yes. And another, another uh, important component is season of use. So in the Deschutes Basin, the irrigation season goes from October, or excuse me, April 1st through October 31st. And so if you use water outside of that, that's actually not considered a beneficial use. So the beneficial use and the season are restricted. Yeah. So yeah, so people are, everybody's water rights has, have all these very specific things on them. And so that is an important, an important takeaway from this talk because it comes into play later when we start talking about solutions, about how we move water around in the basin from places where it's needed to places where it's maybe not used as efficiently right now. So um, we have another potentially clarifying question in the audience. Yes. <laughs> We, we have a microphone here right behind you. <laughs> so when the um, first, you know, rights were given in the early eight, 1900s, uh, were, would people typically come in and ask for one type of use or multiple kinds of uses? Uh, so early on, there, were, there weren't a lot of uses of water. It was irrigation, stock water, and domestic, and yes. then some power generation. And basically that was it. Yeah, and that's an important point. That's actually my next question was to talk about what is or was considered a beneficial use. Just like Kyle said, you know, farming, ranching, irrigation, stock watering, domestic use, power generation. I feel like later industry got sort of added into the into that. But um, question for the audience: Guess who got left out of the beneficial use <laughs> back in 1909 when they set up the system? Yeah, the river, the river and nature and fish got left out. Um, there, that leaving water in the stream was not considered a beneficial use in 1909 when we passed the Oregon Water Code. So, so yeah, tell us. I mean, the goal, right, was to drain the rivers. That's you know, yeah. The, and you have to. So we're still back in 1909, 1909. 1910 in that era, and. Uh, making a living and living mm -hmm. in Central Oregon was hard. Yes. Uh, you had to grow your own food. You, you know, you had to take care of yourself and, and water running down the river to those folks was a waste of water because it right. could have been put to beneficial use to grow food. And so that was the mindset back then. Right. Yeah. So again, no villains in the story, but that is, that is the system and the way that it was established. The whole goal was to put the water to use on the land, um, and leaving it in stream was was not was not considered beneficial. Yes, we have another question in the audience. Um, I don't know if we have a mic, but you can. I can repeat it. Go for it. Okay. What were the tribes getting at that time? That is a very good question. So the question for the audience at home is, what were the tribes getting at that point in time? Kyle, what was going on? Uh, the, at that time, the tribes were not recognized as water right holders or had any yeah. right to the water. Yeah. They were left out entirely, yes. They were, they were not treated well in this part of the story, certainly. Um, Just a teaser, you would talk about the water right settlement that did happen eventually? Actually, yeah. Let, do you mind just sort of interjecting a little bit about that? So, no, that, not, not okay. at all. Um, I'm good at sidetracking. But, uh, <laughs> Not too far. Okay, a little, little bit. bit of a side. We're going to talk okay, about, yeah, the, go for it. The most remarkable and wonderful things about the Deschutes Basin is that we have this great partnership with the Warm Springs tribes. Uh, their water rights uh, date back to older than any other water right. That's how they describe it in their, um, the water rights settlement. But in the late 80s into in the early 1990s, the Warm Springs tribes entered into settlement negotiations with uh, all the entities that have a role in water rights in the basin. And in 1997, the Deschutes River adjudication adopted the Warm Springs Tribe's water rights settlement into the adjudication. So uh, the tribal rights in this basin are quantified and they're known. And that makes uh, work in the basin much more, um, uh, you can, you can, you can, you're starting from a point of known quantities and who has what. So there are other basins in the state, maybe one to the south, <laughs> that none of that is settled yet, and it's still up in the air. And so it makes it difficult to negotiate deals, to work with partners, uh, to, to establish 
uses in the basin when there's so much unknowns. In the Deschutes, however, it's known, quantified, and put into a decree that says this is what the tribes get, this is their water right, and they have the oldest water right in the basin. It just took 92 years, I think, to get there, but yeah. yes. Um, Can we, can we actually save that one to the, the question was what other tribes in Oregon have adjudicated water rights? And I love that question, but just, a cl <laughs> well, I don't know, is it a short answer? Uh, so the <laughs> Umatilla tribe is going through a uh, negotiation right now, and that's the only one I know of. Yeah, so not a lot of the adjudication process has been completed, but it is completed in the Deschutes Basin. So I'm going to roll back the clock then from 1997 and the adjudication process back to, um, oh, we've got a question in the back. Some questions coming in online, I oh, think okay. that are relative, um, pertinent. So <laughs> what is the term riparian rights? When does the term riparian rights become involved? I believe riparian rights have to do with the East Coast yeah, system e of water If you're water east rights. of the Mississippi, you can worry about it, but west of the Mississippi, you don't have to worry about it. Yeah. It, I know. <laughs> okay. So east of the Mississippi, California, where these are some of the... Yeah. In the it, Deschutes, nothing, just for those folks at home. And then one more question. In the past, how often and how was the river water diversion actually measured? and confirmation that the use was solely for appurtenant lands. Yeah, with the weirs, right? And with the water master. Yeah, well, so in, an, in a, an adjudication, the state engineer or the water resources department goes out and evaluates the claims that the holders have. And so in the Deschutes and other basins, the state engineer goes out, makes measurements, makes maps, uh, quantifies the use, looks at the crops, does a complete evaluation of, is this water right claim legitimate? How much land did they actually put water to beneficial use? Are they putting it to beneficial use? How much water is diverted? So in, in Central Oregon and Deschutes River, the Water Resources Department plays a prominent role in measuring all the diversions on the river. And so we have a really good and long record of water use measurement in the Deschutes Basin. It happens to be one of the the most measured and, and best measured uh, basins in the state. Fantastic. Do we have any more questions at home? Okay, oh, we're, we're gonna roll behind. it along then. Um, <laughs> going back then to um, just after uh, 1909, we're back in 1909 when the water right system uh, came into development and these are all the important pieces in, the, in a water right, um, including beneficial use and the river getting left out of the equation. Um, so my question is, at what point in time did um, we essentially use up all of the water that was in the river, right? Because, I mean, they were giving out water rights and people were staking claims. Um, so at what time did, did that happen? When did that happen? Um, for Bend, the rapid development of uh, settlement, uh, timber and irrigation were the big things in Bend. And the population grew dramatically from 1900 to 1905. And there was so much speculation by 1913, uh, probably on the order of five times the available water at Bend, the state engineer, which is the Water Resources Department, uh, said, okay, stop, time out. We are not going to divert or speculate or propose any more projects on the Deschutes River. So in 1913, the state engineer withdrew the upper Deschutes River from further appropriation. But at that time, they knew that there was more land to be irrigated and they set aside a future development called the Deschutes Project. And that Deschutes Project is now known as uh, North Unit Irrigation District and Wikiup Reservoir. Yeah. So by 100 and 109 years, years ago, ago, all the water that was in the river had been accounted for by the water right system. And so in order to get more water um, or enable the use of more water, they had to store water, right? So that is how we end up with reservoirs and dams. We built reservoirs and dams effectively to store, to store water. Um, so we have a map here of the irrigation districts in the Deschutes Basin um, and the priority dates associated with the different rights of those irrigation districts. And what's interesting to note about Bend is that Bend was the, was the municipality at the time, and so all the areas around Bend were settled first, right? I mean, so those water rights that are, the older water rights are close to the city of Bend, 
But when you get up north towards the pink area on the map, which is Madras, that's the area that, that Kyle's referring to as the Deschutes pro Project. That, their water right is a 1913 water right. So there was already no water in the river. And in order to serve those lands in the, the northern part of this, of this map, they had to build Wikiup Reservoir, which is the Deschutes Project. So, um, and that made that caused some some fundamental changes to the way that the the system was was managed. So um, I am going to I'm going to go to the next I'm going to focus on this, but we're going to go to the next slide. So you can see the what we refer to as the upper basin, which is really confusing because it's in the lower portion of the map because <laughs> the river flows from north or from south to north. We have um, Wikiup Reservoir and Crane Ferry Reservoir. Um, so Kyle, yeah, they built Wikiup Reservoir and then um, they're taking the water from Wikiup Reservoir, they're storing it in, in the wintertime and they're releasing it in the summertime when the farmers need water during that season of use, as Kyle talked about, that are associated with those water rights. And that water is, is moving all along the Deschutes River and then it is actually diverted at the city of Bend. And this goes back to the whole system was built long before there were pumps and or any electricity. So everything had to be gravity fed. So in order to feed the pink area up there, the water is actually leaving the river in Bend. That's where the water leaves the river and it goes 26 miles before it makes any deliveries to farms. That's 26 miles in a canal, not the river, no fish. <laughs> um, and this is the this is the diversion dam that was built. So this might be familiar to some of you, but this is in the city of Bend. It's downstream from the old mill, um, but it is upstream from the River House. If anybody's ever gone and had a meal at the River House or stayed at the River House, um, and at this point, this is where all the water is taken out and then diverted into canals. Not all the water, but a good chunk of the water is diverted into canals and and headed north as part of the um, Deschutes project. So, yeah. Um, Anything to add there, Kyle? I sure. feel like I stole your thunder. Uh, that's <laughs> just all right. Like... Um, just one clarifying note. The oldest water rights in Central Oregon are in the Prineville area on the tributaries to Ochoco Creek, 1868, oh. 1869 on Wychus Creek. 1900 is when the development occurred in Bend. And really, the uh, reason why that is is because folks looked at the, the Deschutes River and said, there's a lot of rock to dig out between the river and the farms. Um, so it took, it took a, a conglomeration or a corporation or a district to organize and get the funds available to construct those, can, those large canals that we see in, in Central Oregon. The other aspect of why Bend is where Bend is, is it is the last place on the Deschutes River where you can divert water by gravity uh, and irrigate large tracts of land. Once you head north of Bend, the river goes into a canyon and there's no way to get water out of the river uh, to irrigate land uh, by gravity. So you gotta remember there's no electricity, everything had to be in ditches and gravity fed. Yeah, yeah, so that explains why, um, yeah. I was gonna say something more. Uh, early on in my career, I'd, um, I'd get up early in the morning and meet the, uh, the ditch rider from North Unit at this dam <laughs> And our job was to make sure that there was no more than 30 cubic feet per second flowing over that dam. You have 2,000 CFS cubic feet per second coming into Bend and 30 CFS leaving. And our job was to make sure there was just a trickle going over that dam, which is called an OG crest for yeah. you guys with trivia. And so CFS is cubic feet per, per second, second, and you don't really have to understand that, but the scale of 2,000 CFS entering town and 30 CFS leaving town is the important takeaway point there. Um, yeah, so if you were to go downstream of the Old Mill District and Sawyer Park, you'd see a completely different river. And we, yeah, we have some pictures of that as well. Um, we have another clarifying question. Just in the, a quick question in the photo, what's the CFS area? Yeah, that is a good, yeah. the question is, what is the CFS guesstimate of what's the CFS going over the dam in this photo? So it's a recent photo because of all those houses back there. <laughs> <laughs> and the fish ladder for the dam, which was put in by the Watershed Council and, and others. It's in the foreground. Uh, I'm going to guess it's probably about 130. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So this whole system of prior appropriation and water rights has resulted in, um, in a distribution of who has water um, and also who needs water. So we're, we're going to talk a little bit about that. 
Um, this is the current distribution of water rights in the Deschutes Basin. And you guys, can, you guys can see where the biggest slice of the pie is. This always really surprises people, and I think this is a very important graphic to share because um, you'll see that municipalities, which is cities, towns, et cetera, domestic use, is 2%. Um, and so I like to use this as a myth buster because folks are always saying, you know, it's the breweries and the, the golf courses and, and others, but 86% of the water rights in this basin are, are used for irrigation. Um, and then that 12% of in-stream, we're going to talk about that um, in a bit, but essentially that 12% is water that is now dedicated in-stream with an older priority date, with some security that it's going gonna, it's gonna to stay in there. There was a clarifying question in the back of the... Question, you just pointed out something about breweries, and the statement is referencing, this conversation tonight is referencing water in the Deschutes Basin and not potable water out of the wells, is that correct? Yeah, we're not talking about groundwater, but we are going to talk about groundwater soon. <laughs> right, but in your reference to breweries using water, that is not accurate based upon the conversation tonight. Uh, uh, it, it actually, uh, that 2% of the municipality... Let's give Kate a microphone. Right, do you want to... I'll take, a sh I'll take a crack at it. The 2% includes the municipal use of water, which is groundwater, except for the city of Bend uses Bridge Creek, Tumalo Creek. But that does include the groundwater that the city of Bend and other municipalities have a right to. So that does cover the yeah. breweries as well. Is that correct, Kyle? That's right. I think uh, Lisa was just uh, kind of generally explaining the perception. Right. You know, we're not getting down to specific water rights because there's a lot of details. But the perception folks have are golf courses and breweries use a lot of water. Well, what we're trying to illustrate here is the water rights, uh, the magnitude is that the water rights associated with agriculture far exceed what municipal water rights are equivalent to. That's our point. Yes. Yes. Ground and surface. Yes. Um, clarifying uh, golf courses, um, we have a farm that's two miles away from the proposed Thornburg um, development. Our wells are running dry. Our water rights, we're getting, we have water seven days on, seven days off. It's very hard to farm with that. Is Thornburg considered a municipal use, or what is a thousand unit resort that has three golf courses? Are you saying that that's not gonna affect the well, Deschutes? Let, I, that is a really good question and very important to talk about, but if it's okay with you, we're gonna, we're gonna move on just so we can get through the slides, okay. and then we can get into that, and we actually, I, I want to make the, the point that you're bringing up is, is an important point, and the groundwater issue is an important point, and the fact that groundwater and surface water are essentially, it's one pot of water in the Deschutes Basin, and in most places, it's one source. So we're actually going to, um, we're going to bring a groundwater-specific talk to you coming very soon, because we understand that that's on the minds of a lot of people out there. So we're... And, and the breweries. Yes, you I'm know, sorry. I feel like I opened okay. up a can of worms. Right. <laughs> so I apologize. <laughs> that was not my intention. We have one more. Is it clarifying question? I think so. Okay. <laughs> well, this is about rate. Okay, uh, here. Yeah, going. Let's give him a microphone. My question is about rate, and he talked about the diversion and how rate was part of that. How was that determined? So, how could a, a, a claimant decide I want two feet of water versus, versus three feet of water? in an early claim, because that obviously has an influence on how big that 86% is. A absolutely. So uh, the judge that oversaw the adjudication for the Deschutes River was very generous to the irrigation districts. Some of the irrigation districts' uh, water, their duty, which is how much water you can divert over time, over the season, is nearly 10 acre feet per acre. So 10 feet of water can be diverted. Um, but you have to use it beneficially, so that actually doesn't, it isn't that much that they divert. But that's how the water rights, except for North Unit, were established by the adjudication uh, by a judge determining that this is the amount of water uh, needed to divert to get to the farms to make a beneficial use. And that was overseen by the state engineer and the measurements and the evaluation that it did at the time. All right. Okay. So we're gonna we're gonna move quickly so that we can leave time for questions. Um, so we have Kyle made made mention in this last slide here. Uh oh, clicker not working. 
Uh oh. So we have irrigation districts that were formed in the Deschutes Basin, and those irrigation districts were formed as conglomerations because it was real, no individual was gonna go out and dig a hand, a hand dug ditch for 26 miles from the city of Bend all the way up to Madras to be able to deliver water. Um, and so we have the storage at Wikiup Reservoir and the ditches um, that were dug using irrigation districts together, came together to dig ditches, and I still don't, I, What's our next picture? Um, we wanted to talk so about, about the, the storage, effects. basically the, the oh, okay. impacts of storage. Um, here we go. There we the go. The impacts of storage on the Deschutes River. So um, we talked about we in in the North Unit Canal photo with the 30 C, 2,000 CFS down to 30 CFS. So the upper left-hand photo is a photo of the Deschutes River. Um, this was not a recent photo. This is before, again, the work of the DRC and its partners in working to restore flows. But um, this is what the, what the river looked like. It was essentially mostly diverted um, below bend in the summertime. And then you've got these other two photos, the one on the upper right and the one on the bottom that um, show the upper Deschutes River uh, in the wintertime. So when they were effectively storing water, they closed the dam and they were putting water in the in the reservoir so that they could service irrigation um, needs in the summertime. So this is essentially, these are the problems that the DRC was created to resolve with its partners and it takes, takes all of us coming together to make that happen. Um, I know for those of you that weren't at the last talk, this is a hydrograph. How many people in here are familiar with a hydrograph? Just, okay, a handful of you. So this is the way that hydrologists um, take a look at what a river flow is doing. So on the, on the X ax or the Y axis, we have flow, and on the X axis, we have time. And down below, we have the months of the year, and it's, it's written by the, what they consider the water year, right? October through September. So the natural flow of the Chutes River was the blue line, pretty stable over the course of the entire year, and this has to do with the hydrology of the basin. And I encourage you all, if you haven't watched it, to watch the seminar from last time when we talk a lot more about why and how the, the Deschutes River is so unique because of its hydrology. But then when you start storing water, you, we ended up with this altered hydrograph um, where you've got really low flows that we just saw in the last picture happening in, um, the, this is below Wikiup. So this is really low flows in the winter months and then really high flows in the summer months. So um, yes. So we have another graphic to depict this. Um, the left side is the winter, um, what happens to the river in the winter months, and the right side is the summer. And as you can see, you know we've got the dam storing water, so reducing the upper Deschutes to um, lower flows. Um, right now, those minimum flows are 100 plus, 100 plus right? 105? 100 well, yeah, <laughs> under the HCP, yeah. Under the HCP. Um, and then you can see Bend, right, looks in both, this is what's interesting and in where we started with this presentation, right? The city of Bend, like if you're sitting at the old mill, if you're there in the winter or you're there in the summer, it looks pretty okay. It's those, those problems that are below Bend or above Bend that are, are hidden. So, um, uh, clarifying question? Yeah, you just <laughs> Hold on. mentioned the HCP and it sounds like that might be another variable yeah. that we yeah. want to have a quick Yes, um, let's, let's talk about the HCP, but before we do that, let's um, just get through a few more slides and then we'll get into how sort of things have changed. And we're starting, so we want, I'm gonna skip over that. So remember, going back to the fact that the Deschutes River and all rivers were not given water rights back in 1909 when the state set out the system. Um, but that did change, right? So um, we're gonna talk a little bit about how that changed. In 1987, there, were, there was a, a the a Conserved Water Act was pa passed in the state. Um, can you tell us about it, Kyle? Sure. So go through time, the irrigation dominant use of water in the state. Um, you know, we're, we're seeing fish populations decline. We're seeing uh, more free time, you don't have to, grow your own food, you can go to the grocery store. So it gives you a little more free time to, to recreate on the rivers. And folks are looking at the rivers going, wow, you know, look at that river, it's really low. What can we do about that? And so uh, folks in the legislature in 1987 
passed the in stream water rights act which was a landmark legislation for oregon that recognize that in stream uses are beneficial use and so prior to that there was the state did not recognize in stream uses as beneficial uses so that that legislation also included the conserve water act and really the genesis for conserve water came from the deschutes basin there was a river study done in completed in 1986 that said probably the the best way to restore our river flows is through conservation because of those leaky canals that had those huge water rights and there was the opportunity to do conservation to restore stream flows and that's the genesis of in stream uh, restoration and the genesis of the Deschutes River Conservancy. Yeah. So in 1987, the tables were turned a little bit. The river, the river got got listed as a beneficial use, and some tools were developed. And let's specifically talk a little bit about um, leasing and transfers, which are effectively the tools that we use um, to be able to put water back in the river, or actually let it stay in the river <laughs> instead of being diverted. So. You want to talk a little bit? This um, is a map of, yeah, I'll let you. Yeah, so uh, being the water master in 19, the mid-1990s and making sure that White Chiefs Creek was dry in the summer, because if it wasn't, I'd get a call to say, Kyle, you're not doing your job. Had a gentleman come into the office, and his name was Ted Eady, in 1997. He said, Kyle, I have a, a ranch in Sisters, and it's that it's part of that outline there. And he goes, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, incorporate into the city and I want to develop develop uh, this land but I have a water right on the land what do I do with it I said well we have this new law that says if you transfer it in stream you can uh, you can sell it there's this water trust out there with Andrew Perky and uh, the Deschutes Basin Land Trust and we all got together and said okay let's work with this landowner and put that water in stream and so he thought you know I want to do something good for the stream uh, and so the first permanent in-stream transfer was removed from this property and put in stream in White Chiefs Creek. So White Chiefs Creek in 1998, the first summer, it went from zero to 1.8 cubic feet per second. And I was the one responsible with how to figure out how to do that, how to measure it, and how to protect it. So it was a, that was a tough summer in 1998. <laughs> But this is an important point because otherwise, if you think about the, the law passing in 1987, if a river went to apply, and it wasn't the rivers that actually applied, obviously, but if someone were to apply for a water right for a river, and that date was 1987, let's go back in time, we knew all the water was already spoken for by 1913. So by 1987, a water right that said water was going to be in stream was, was relatively useless. It would never actually result in water in stream. So that's where the transfer, the idea of transferring water from a land, again, remember the water right is a pertinent to the land, it goes with the land. So that water right has that priority date and it's an old priority date and you're able to take that and you're actually able to transfer it and put it, that's why we say back in the stream, which is a little confusing because you're not, act, I mean the water's staying in the stream, it's not actually getting moved back into the stream. But that is, um, that's the tool, is a, is a transfer. And at the same time, there's also a leasing tool. But I feel like, do we have a clarifying question in the audience? OK. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, coming right. with um, so did I hear you correctly that it, it was between 1987 to 1998 to get the first transfer to happen? So between the law being made and the mechanism of it being implemented took that long? So yeah, that's for, right. So for the folks at home, the question is, was was it really between, did it really take from 1987 to 1998 when the law, 1987 when the law was passed to 1998 to actually transfer the, the first water? Yeah, there, um, one of the irrigation districts in 1992 agreed to a, it was a drought year and there was a temporary drought transfer in stream on Tumalo Creek. So that was the first water right uh, restoration on Tumalo Creek because it also went dry below uh, Shevlin Park, and so 1992. And then from 1992 on, there were more in-stream leases with the Bend Parks and Rec property, uh, and then some of the districts. Uh, but there was in-stream leasing. One thing I forgot to mention about the, uh, the 1987 uh, Act was that it gave ODFW, DEQ, and the Water Resources Department the authority to apply for a water right. But as Lisa was talking about, you apply for a water right in 1990, 
your priority date is so junior, it's irrelevant right. to all the existing uses in Eastern Oregon because all the water was already spoken for. So that's one aspect of it, but the more important one and the one that's been used extensively in the Deschutes is the fact that when you do a transfer, the priority date is maintained. Right. And so it's not a new priority date, it maintains the old priority date, and that's where it can compete with existing uses and make a meaningful right. difference. So that 12% of the pie, that was that, that accounts for water rights that have been transferred, or at least in stream, so they have more secure, older priority dates. Um, because otherwise that pie would have been, there would have been no in-stream component to that pie. And I feel like Kate wants to chime in in the back there. I do, am I? <laughs> you, um, you guys are doing a fantastic job. I just want to make one comment. Time. It took, what, 10 years to do the first transfer. Since then in Wychus Creek, it took over 20 years. We've gone from 1.8 CFS, that very first transfer, through um, to 35 CFS protected in-stream restoring a steelhead stream. And so we've been able to scale these tools, and this is, what we're most excited to talk about. I did want to just time check you all because you're yep. up there. Yep. That we're we're pretty close to 7:30, and so and maybe we are hit on the most important salient points to lead us into our next series. And then if people are interested and available to stick around for questions for a few extra minutes, it's hard to it's hard to condense this and it's hard to not have time for questions. So just wanted to let you know the time. Yep, thank you. Um, yeah. So this is what Kate is talking about based on all this work and and Kyle sort of alluded to it. So we have transfers, permanent transfers, where you're taking water that was pertinent to the land and you're transferring it back into the stream. We also have a leasing program that's a, that's a tool that's available. And I, do you want to just talk for a few seconds about what a lease is, how that's a little bit different? And that's also an important tool. But we have a restored Y2's Creek. It no longer runs dry in, in, yes. in the summertime in um, Sisters. And so this is the work of, of the DRC and the partners of the DRC. And we are continuing to do this work using these tools with all of our partners, which includes irrigation districts, the Oregon Water Resources Department, um, the farmers, the ranchers, like it, it's gonna take all hands on deck um, and all the tools in the toolkit to, to be able to do this and to restore the stretches of river that we talked about that have, um, that have largely been dewatered as a result of, of the history. So um, I know we really don't have a whole lot of time left in our official time, but we are, we are here until eight o'clock. Um, we have the, the space until eight o'clock. And um, I don't know, unless you wanted to say something more about leasing or... Oh, I can talk about <laughs> leasing if you want. Uh, so folks that have water rights, I don't know if anybody in the audience does, but they are something that people hold very dearly. And there's even you know, people today where they remember their grandparents saying, don't ever give up that water right. You know, never give it up. And so that, that intrinsic value to a person that has a water right, they're never gonna give it up. But the leasing program, it, I think, is an awesome tool that works really well and is extremely cost effective. So if somebody doesn't wanna give up their water right, they can lease it in stream temporarily. It has the same effect as a transfer, but the owner gets to keep the water right. And so I always say that, you know, people that come to Central Oregon and they, they go out and they have to uh, move their irrigation pipe and they do that a couple summers and it digs into their time to go fishing or bike riding, they say, man, I do not want to do that anymore. What can I do with my water right? Well, you can come to the DRC and lease it in stream. You get a beneficial use, so you don't have to worry about use it or lose it, and you get to recreate and you get to maintain your water right. So leasing is a wonderful tool. We have two questions in the audience. We're coming with the mic right there. <laughs> On the lease issue, can you clarify? Can you, one of the issues I've heard is that in order to lease your water right, you have to lease your entire water right. Is it possible to lease part of your water right or does it have to be all of your water right? So we'll define part because <laughs> that's important. Yes. So water rights attached to the land. So you can identify if you have, let's say you have 10 acres and the five acres are really hard and troublesome and you don't wanna uh, deal with it, you can lease five of your 10 acres and you can, you can continue to irrigate the five good acres, but you can lease your other five acres in stream. There's another nuance to leasing. You can do what's called a split season leasing, lease that you can irrigate your property for a portion of the summer and then you can split lease it in stream for the remaining part of the summer. But the one thing you cannot do is you can't lease part of your duty. Right. 
So being so right now, there is no way, although we are working on this, this is one of the things that we are really working on. If you decide to, to go from flood irrigation to a really new fancy system that uses far less water and you're still able to irrigate all of your lands, that the difference, the conservation, ba based, basically that amount that you can serve right now, you can't yet lease that in stream. So, um, so like Kyle said, you'd have to essentially fallow a, a portion of your property to be able to lease a portion of your rights. But that is something that the DRC is hard at work sort of trying to figure out how do we, how do, we do that? Because we realize like people want to conserve water, right? People want to like find more efficient ways to do this and we want to be able to, to incentivize that and put that water to good use in other areas in the basin, whether that's for North Unit Irrigation District to be able to farm or for the river. So that is an excellent question and I'm glad you brought that up. And then we had one other question over here. Uh, I have 20 acres on Arnold Irrigation and I reached out to them about leasing and they said they would not let me lease my water rights during a drought year. Uh, do you have any idea why that would be the case and are you aware of that? I'm not aware of it, but I imagine it has something to do with the er internal um, use of water within the district. And so an irrigation district and a patron have a, re uh, a relationship that they have to work through. Uh, a, a patron cannot take their irrigation district water right and do with it whatever they want. They have to work through the district. The district looks out for all the patrons and the, um, the benefit of the district. And so they, I don't know what the particulars are, but maybe there was a reason why you couldn't lease it this year because of water shortage. And I don't know. I also want to point out that, you know, some of the pictures that we showed of the hand dug canals and the weirs and all that, that is all still very much in play today. Like we don't have some fancy technological system where we're just like, oh, so-and-so wants to turn off and so-and-so wants to turn on and we want to move water here, there and everywhere. I mean. That is, that is the work of what we are doing with the partners right now, is trying to, to generate a system that would enable you like, to be able to easily say, oh, I, I don't need my water this year, so we're going to turn it off and we're going to put it in another place where it's put to use. But again, because we're very much dealing with weir blades and hand dug canals and not fancy pipe systems with you know, technology where you just program your phone and all of a sudden you can deliver the water where it goes. And so my guess would be that that's the answer to the question is it really just was probably an actual infrastructure issue where it wasn't physically possible for them to be able to not deliver you water and at the same time deliver your neighbor's water who needed it or something like that. So it really is and that's very much what we are all working on. We're going to continue in future seminars. We're going to talk about more of these tools that we're working on. We're working on piping canals. We're working on upgrading irrigation systems from flood irrigation to more um, efficient tech, you know, modern technology that can still get farmers what they need um, and still grow crops, but with less water. Those are in the leasing program and the transfer program. And those, that's the work of the DRC. And that is what we are going to continue to to talk to you about and walk you through. And we really appreciate though, this is like the foundation, right? We're like, we're, we're literally at water 101 <laughs> between last, last time seminar and this time seminar to just kind of lay the groundwork so you all understand very much what we're dealing with. Like it's, it, it seems like it should be so easy. Let's just move the water from there to there and problem solved. Um, and I wish, I wish it were that easy, but I guess if it were, we wouldn't have jobs. That's right. <laughs> so, um, yeah, do we have another question in the audience? Here we got, we got the microphone coming so the people at home can hear you. I'm curious, I read an article that had said some private entities could buy water rights. How is that possible given what you told us tonight, where it's tied to the land? Well, there's very, l I can't even think of a limitation of who could own a water right. A municipality can have a water right, an individual can have a water right, a corporation can have a water right. So there's really no limit of who owns a water right. And remember, a water right is a right to use water. It doesn't mean that you own the water. It's a right to use. There's a fancy term for it, but um, anyway, it's a right to use. So anybody can own a water right. Yeah. But if it's not... It, I mean, typically they would have to acquire the land, right, to be able to, and then maybe go through a process where they transfer that water right from that piece of land to another use. Oh. 
So that is how I would guess um, they might go about acquiring a water right. Because you can't just go up to so-and-so and say like, hey, I really want to buy your water right and use it over here. Again, that per everything we talked about tonight, that, that system is, that doesn't, that's not how it works. <laughs> so, but that's my guess. Yep. Yep. Kate's going to add. To, just to clarify that there are circumstances where people outside of irrigation districts sell their water rights and they're bought specifically not with the land, but to transfer um, for use for development or for mitigation and it goes in stream, but it allows groundwater pumping. Those are very few and far between. Almost all of the water is controlled and managed by irrigation districts. In Central and so, Oregon. In Central Oregon. So currently there's not a lot of, I think what we all read in the OPB article raised some, some red flags that it's out for the highest bidder. There's very few of those water rights sort of on the market. And currently the irrigation districts kind of control who can buy and sell water. And we used to have a water bank that actually managed the sort of orderly use of that to discourage speculation, and we're working to do that again. Um, but right now, that was more the exception than the rule, and the irrigation districts are not currently selling water to um, the highest bidder. And we hope when they are ready to sell water that's urbanizing, we'll do it in that orderly manner that keeps everybody whole. And that could be a whole topic in its own right. Um, Kyle, do you want to add anything? <laughs> No, nah, you said it pretty well. Okay. I think we have one more question. We have another. We have a couple questions over here on the. I, this I just want to make sure we have time for questions from folks online. We've had a few stack up so far, and I want to make sure we get to those. Okay. Um, but I will get to this individual up here, and then if we have time after that, it might okay. be good to hit some of those. All right. Thank you, Jacob. What fraction of the in-stream 12% is leased, and what is the target lease and non-lease for in-stream? Where's Jen Ooh. when we need her? Yeah, I know. <laughs> okay, Kate, again, can answer that question in I, the back. Yeah, I feel like I, you I should come up here, Kate. Um. Um, no, you guys have done a fantastic job. But yeah, for <laughs> an example, in the middle of Deschutes is a really good example of, I should get in front of you, um, the portfolio of integrating tools. And so I, I might, don't quote me on this, but right now there's 115 CFS in the middle Today. of Deschutes below Today. end. Every single drop of that water is from a project or program we've done with the irrigation districts, mostly. Uh, I would say a third, a third of that is in-stream leasing, a third of that is in-stream permanent transfers, and a third, maybe more than a third, is from um, piping conservation, which is a tool that we didn't talk about too much, but we will in a future session. So it's really all those tools coming together to restore flow. Same as White Cheese Creek, yeah. although piping's yeah. probably a bigger proportion there. And the all piping results in transfers that then go in stream, so, the, yeah. The vast, the vast majority is permanent water in stream. Yeah, so and it, so it differs depending on which reach of water we're talking, which reach of the stream we're talking about, but. But that's like the floor, what's the? So the, well, for instance, um, the shoots blow bend, the in-stream water rate that was applied for, it's not there in place yet, is 250 CFS in the summertime. So we're about a little less, little less than half of that one. Um, the other streams vary by month, and I don't remember exactly the numbers, but it's 30 to 50 CFS. So that's actually an important point, is that there are state in-stream water rights that different entities like the Parks Department and Others have, have ODFW applied for, is ODFW it, yeah. has applied for in-stream, state in-stream water rights to kind of create that, like this is the target of what we're trying to get in this section of stream. But until we start using these tools like piping and leasing and, and um, transfers, we're, we're kind of, we're, we're trying to get to those, those targets. So those targets exist, um, but, but they're not always met because we haven't yet been able to, to mobilize the tools to make it happen. So. Um, we got an online um, question? Yeah, there's a few. We'll just start with this first one from uh, someone online a few minutes ago. Uh, we're just hoping you could talk a bit more about the tribal water rights and if they're actually meaningful or if it's just what's left over. Uh, no, the tribal rights, well, I, again, they're, they are the most senior yep. and they're not trivial. They range from on the Deschutes River uh, below the Pelton Roundview project, uh, 3,000 to 3,500 cubic feet per second, it varies by month. Then they have other water rights on the Metolius and all the streams that are on the Warm Springs Reservation have water rights of some kind. So they do have substantial water rights and they're uh, you know, very important. And the oldest water rights in the basin. The so oldest water rights in the very basin. So definitely not trivial. <laughs> yeah. Sure, great, thank you. And then there's another question. You know, We discussed the prior appropriation law early on in this discussion, You know, place of use, um, 
person time, person right. Um, so we've had some folks wondering, has there been any efforts to change prior appropriation law and what, what success has that been? Well, so uh, the year after, the next legislative session after 1909 when the water code was uh, passed, the Oregon water code has been tweaked and changed and, and uh, modified just by a little bit here and there and things have been added over time. But the fundamental principle of prior appropriation and those four, you know, four plus fundamentals of water rights remain the same. And I'll just follow up and say that I think changing prior appropriation doctrine would be a lot like, let's just get rid of capitalism. <laughs> like, quite honestly, I mean, I know, I know that sounds extreme, but I mean, it is a system that has been in place for 100 years and has dictated the entire development of the West. And although it is far from perfect, and we all could easily, we could whiteboard a bunch of ways in which to make it better, and, and as a, as a Professor, I used to do this with students all the time, but at the end of the day, it is the system that we have. And so I really feel like totally like throwing a wrench in it and completely upending the system and creating a new system is, is probably a far reaching at this point, much like totally upending capitalism. Um, that's my analogy. So Kate's gonna <laughs> um, chime in. <laughs> I know, I'm sorry. I can't help it because a brochure of the Deschutes Basin Water Collaborative up here. It's a group that's working with us, but broader to meet all the needs. And as part of that, some of the ways water law works are clunky for what we're trying to do to meet needs for farmers, cities, and the river. And if we together as a community can come up with some policy ideas that are more flexible than what's mm -hmm. currently on the books, I believe the state legislature and the Oregon Water Resources Department would be amenable to that. And that is my personal nirvana, would be <laughs> yeah. as a basin to say, OK, do, let's do this a little bit differently, because it's not working for farmers. We didn't talk that much about the impacts to North Unit, but they are facing extreme scarcity. Um, if there's things that we know could work better and still meet all the needs, why wouldn't we try to create the flexibility in the dispute? So that's you know one of the reasons to pay attention to the collaborative and support that work is it's, a, it's an opportunity that I think the state is kind of looking for us to say, can you can you figure this out at a basin scale? It wouldn't mm -hmm. be for Oregon or the West, but just for the Deschutes Basin. Yeah. All right, do we have another question online? Or we got a couple more questions in the audience as well. There's one more question online, and it okay. kind of relates to the last one. Um, so in light of the prior appropriation law, um, how often are investigations actually happening that people are complying? Um, does somebody have to make a complaint, or are there actually investigations routinely? So that's a good question. Uh, Oregon has 24 water masters and various assistant water masters, and we have over 100,000 water rights. And so a water master cannot oversee all the water rights in his districts. But I'll tell you what, neighbors are very good <laughs> at watching what their, what their other neighbor does. And if something's not right, they'll give us a call. And so that begins the investigation for watermaster staff to go out and check to see what's going on to make sure no illegal uses are occurring. There's a lot of basins um, or the gauges that we have that we monitor the in-stream water rights on behalf of the citizens of Oregon. We have gauging stations that uh, transmit data real time. And so any, any time of the day, whether I'm bored at night or on the weekends, I can check flows and see what, where we're at on certain flows and I know how much should be there. And so we can proactively monitor in-stream water rights and, and diversions yeah. uh, as needed. But and that varies across basins. Yeah. And again, I'll just make a plug that the Deschutes is the best managed, measured <laughs> basin in the state. Yeah, and a lot of, from what I understand too, a lot of the, the management, I mean it is, na neighbors will tell you if, you if you're not doing it right, but they also use aerial photography to see what is literally greened up. So the, that, that is sort of the, the tool in the toolkit right now is to, to take pictures and fly over and try to figure out who's irrigating and who's not irrigating. Because it's, right now, if you go out there, it's really obvious. I'm sure you guys have seen how obvious it is, um, what is what's getting irrigated and what's not. So that's the other tool that, that is used. Because yeah, 24 people to cover, would you say, 100,000 water, water rights? rights? That's, it's, yeah, it's a big job. So I think we have two more questions, or three more questions, so let's, let's yeah. Yes. Thanks. Um, I actually have two, if that's okay. 
One was, um, I was thinking about the adjudicated water rights, especially those that were established after the documents of the water rights. You said some of those burned in fires and things like that. Have any of those ever been legally challenged? And if so, why not? Are they subject to being challenged? And then the second one was on the transfer of water rights. Are there restrictions on that in terms of transfer to a different use or transfer to a different location? That's it. Um, so I'm not aware of any challenges. Typically, and it, it's very rare, a challenge to a water right is uh, non-use. Somebody would say that, hey, I know that water right hasn't been used for a number of years, and I'm going to file an affidavit that says, I know it hasn't been used, and then that goes to a, what's called a contested case. Um, the, the documents that I talked about uh, that were lost, people probably you know, refiled and, um, you know, established a new record. Um, so those, those generally are not, once a water rights issued a certificate, as long as you continue to use it beneficially once every five years, that water right can live in perpetuity. And so it's rare to be challenged or have something that was a hundred years ago and then somebody would bring up an issue about it. So that's unusual. And the second question was the the transfer, our department processes several hundred transfers a year. And so, uh, you know, the transfer review process is very detailed. Uh, we look for beneficial use. We uh, will not issue a transfer if it causes injury. Injury means depriving another water right, the water that they're entitled to. And so, uh, you know, transfers occur, but they're, you know, just on this order of several hundred statewide. I don't know if that answered your question or not, but. Yeah, the source has to remain the same and, and there can't be injury. So you can't expand a water right. Mm -hmm. So you can't take it from 10 acres and move it to 20 unless you go through the allocation of conserved water. So those restrictions are uh, reviewed when the transfer is submitted to our department. So it does go through a quite an extensive review process. And it can go from one benefit, beneficial use to any other beneficial use. There's no restriction. Well, I, I mean, generally you can change the use in a transfer, but it's it's uncommon. It's typically a location to another location is the vast majority. Or to in-stream. Or to in-stream. Yeah, so. Um, all right, do we have, we're, 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 two more and then I think we probably need to call it. But I love, I mean, I love all the questions and the interest, so thanks. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I've farmed in North Unit and in COI. And in North Unit, we had to call in every day, well, six days a week to determine, you know, tell them how, if we weren't going to water a field, we wouldn't need water for our whole farm. But in COI, in the beginning of the season, well, they do have a, a ramp up period, but is there any analysis on whether that type of, um, let's say call it flexibility, but at least adaptability to like, you know, if it's raining for a week, you don't necessarily need the water to keep coming to see if that would keep more water in stream? Is that, is that even possible? So the, the irrigation district's control and measurement and how they distribute water varies. Um, some districts have measurement on a volume basis. Some are just rate basis. Um, in COI's case, uh, you know, they have a very large water right. It's very generous. Um, they, they'll adjust their head gates as weather conditions change and the, the season occurs. Um, but North Unit uh, is so... Uh, tight on water that they have to s control every aspect of it right. just to save it as much as possible. So it's the water measurement in North Unit is a, on a much greater scale than it is on other districts. Yeah, so I'll say that um, uh, necessity is the mother of all invention and North Unit system has been established for that very reason because of scarcity. And so to answer your question, yes. I mean, the hope is to, to get a much more you know, specific, precise system in place so that we can enable the movement of water um, from places of use currently to places where it's really needed. Um, COI is just not incentivized to do that. Well, the system doesn't incentivize, right? I mean, prior appropriation, the, the, the people with the oldest water rights get 100% of their water rights before other, other um, people that are later in the pecking order. So it's true, I mean, they're not incentivized, um, but we're, 
they are active partners with us though and they are working you know very closely to try to to make to make this happen and to get to more a more efficient system and it would be amazing I and mean, that's my dream is to have a system a coi system that's a lot like north unit system so people can call up and it's all measured and same thing you want to lease and it's no big deal you can flip a switch and it's leasing to this other area i mean that is that is the goal that is what we're working for so yeah <coughs> So uh, in Oregon for water rights, is the rate specified for the point of diversion or the place of use? Uh, the vast majority of water rights are the point of diversion, but believe it or not, Tumalo Irrigation District has a peculiar water right that says that they get 1.8 acre feet a half a mile from the farm. And who, how they came up with that, I don't know, but that's a peculiar one. But the majority are at the diversion point from the stream. All right, that was a really good question. With that, I think we probably need to wrap up unless there are any last minute burning questions. We're gonna still be here for a few more minutes. And um, yeah, we just so appreciate you all coming and we will make the slides accessible to everyone. Um, please fill out your comment cards if there's anything we could do to improve. Let us know if there are specific topics you wanna hear more about. We will be talking about groundwater in future future tops or talk, uh, talks, seminars. Um, we'll also be talking about water banking and piping that's going on in the district. Basically all the tools. We're gonna talk about all the different tools that we're gonna try, that we are trying to, to mobilize to help get the water where it is needed. So thank you all for your interest.